Uh, we are blessed of the Lord to be here and grateful to him that he has given us another opportunity to where we can <clears throat> assemble ourselves together and study his word. Uh, there are many that we are praying for. Uh, first of all, allow me to welcome those of you who are joining us online, whether you're Facebook or YouTube. Uh, are you going to be watching this later on on our church website? We want to welcome you and say thank you that you have joined us for another opportunity. Again, we have many that we are praying for. Uh, we're praying for uh, Sister Nicole Booker's mother, uh, that the Lord will continue to heal her body. We're praying for uh, Brother Jeff Collins, uh, that the Lord will continue to heal his body. Uh, we're praying for, many of you know, uh, I, and I don't know her last name as well as I know her, but her name is Kim. She's part of our death ministry. Uh, we're praying for her husband, who they're expecting to transition at any time. And so we're praying for Kim and her family. <clears throat> I want you to pray for the Goffney family, the Goffney family. Uh, uh, Bill Goffney is the son-in-law to Garland and Vera Green, married to their daughter. We're praying for him. Uh, he fell with an aneurysm, and it's not good, good at this point. So we're praying for the Goffney family. Uh, we know that in spite of what it looks like, in spite of what the doctors might say, we know that God has the last word. And so we're praying for them. We pray continuously for Calvin and uh, Helen Bates as uh, Calvin lays uh, to rest. His sister and Helen's brother is uh, ill. We're praying for the Bates family. We pray for the Lord family, Paul and Joyce Lord. Uh, their son, Paul Jr., as he undergoes chemotherapy. Uh, we're praying for the Campbell family, for James Campbell, as he goes through his uh, illness, that the Lord will bless him. His wife, Myrna, we're praying for that, that Campbell family. Uh, they are members that serve at the Southwest Campus. And so we're asking God's uh, blessings upon them. <clears throat> And I know that there are many others that I may not know the name of, but we do lift them up when we pray. If you will pray solidly and call their names, let me tell you, God will hear your cry and he will answer you uh, accordingly to his own purpose and plan. Amen. Let's pray. God, we honor you as God and thank you for this opportunity that you have granted us. And we pray all that is done and said will be to your glory and your glory alone. We ask that you will put us in the right way and use us, God, uh, as an instrument in your hands. And as you teach and make known the uh, riches of your word, we pray that you would use us in a mighty way. We pray for those that will hear, whether now or later, that you will bless the hearers. And God, we pray that those that have an ear to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church, that you would, in Jesus' name, strengthen them and give them, God, the courage, give them the wisdom they need, give them the strength that they need to live out the truth so that we can all be guilty of being doers of the word and not just hearers. We love you, we honor you, we appreciate you, we adore you, we lift you in perfect praise. And for all those names that was called, that's sick, and we ask that you would heal in the name of Jesus. We know that you have the power to do what no other power can do. And so it's into your hands that we commend our brothers and our sisters and we ask that your healing power will flow in each of their lives. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we uh, look, brothers and sisters, at our, uh, our, our lesson for today, our outline, uh, we're coming from James chapter 4. And you know, uh, we have been studying the book of James with me, and uh, we've been... Uh, in the rotation, and so it's been a few weeks uh, since I've been before you, but we want to continue our study uh, from the book of James, 
and we're looking at an inside job, desires, and diversities. Listen, uh, this is part one. We're going to read verses 1 through 12 today, but we're going to only talk really about verse number one. Uh, it's, it's a lot in that verse that we want to cover. James chapter 4, verse 1 says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covenant and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. To spin it on your passions, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in you, but he gives grace? Therefore, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy but who are you to judge your neighbor? Verse one, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Now listen, James gives two questions there, and I want you to look at those. Two rhetorical questions. What causes war and fights among you is one question. And then he said, is it not this that your passions are at war within you? Those are two rhetorical questions that we are going to attempt to answer today. Amen? Now listen. Remember, the book of James opens with tests and trials. We, we shared that with you, that the book of James was written to believers uh, that were scattered, and James wrote to encourage them, and he delves, he's dealing with tests and trials. And when you get to uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 3, he says, Consider it all joy, or count it, count it all joy, when you go through various trials. And he gives us the reason for the trials. He said, for the, uh, the purpose of the trial is to what? To perfect us. And re always remember, uh, brothers and sisters, when we shared with you that uh, the word trial and the word test, or the word test, rather, and temptation, I'm sorry, trial and temptation has the same Greek word. And when there is a a trial, when God allows a trial to come into your life, or when he allows a test to come into your life, remember it is to uh, cause you or motivate you to draw near unto him. But if you're not careful, Satan will take that same trial or that same test that God designed in order to draw you nearer to him, Satan will take the same test and lure you what? Away from him. 
And so that's critical. I want us to remember that, that uh, each trial, if you're not careful, can become a temptation. It's going to depend on you. Each trial can become a what? A temptation. And so the test and trials James is talking about in the text when he says count it all joy when you fall into various trials. He's not talking about my house got flooded out. He's not talking about my car got blown up or my car caught a fire. But what James is talking about is a test of character. Remember, James is talking about a test of character. And these situations are providing opportunities for testing of character that will draw us to the Lord versus temptations that will do what? That will lure us away from God. So don't, don't forget that. That James is talking about testing of character. And again, these tests that comes into our lives are, are there to either cause us to draw near to God or it will become a temptation that will do what? Lure us away from God. And that's important. And so when we look at that, I think quarrel is one of those places where we are not passing the test. So when the people of God or when the church, when the body of God is busy quarreling with each other, fussing and fighting, when, when there is confusion uh, continuously in the church, it is evident that somebody, if not all of us, are what? Failing the test. Because quarreling is not of God. When we, uh, James is going to tell us the reason we quarrel, the reason we fight, is because we want what we want. And we want what we want, Sister Philip, to the point that most of us, if not all of us, are willing to sin to get it. And we are willing to sin when we don't get it. We want our way, even in the church. And James says that that leads to what? Fighting. That leads to church fights, that leads to church division. And when Paul tells us in Ephesians that we who are the people of God, we who are the body of Christ, we ought to be fighting to maintain the unity of the, uh, of the what? Of the spirit. We ought to be maintaining to, fighting rather to maintain the unity of the spirit. And instead of fighting to maintain the unity of the spirit, we're fighting and quarreling because we want what we want. And always remember, Sister Wesley, at all times, it, whether it, through every trial, Reverend Banks, your character is on display. It is a testing of what? Of the character. And so when we look at James Meaches, at the end of chapter 3, verse 18, uh, James says, those who sow peace will reap peace. Those who sow peace will reap peace. And immediately he asks in uh, chapter 4, verse 1, what or uh, where does quarreling come from? When you look at chapter 3, verse 18, because remember the last time we stood and we were going through James, we talked about wisdom from above versus worldly wisdom. And so James ends chapter 3 by talking about those of you who sow peace, if you sow it, you're going to what? You're going to reap it. And then he goes on to talk about... Um, where is quarreling come from? Because and, and what he's doing, uh, Reverend Phillips, is he's reminding us, uh, as he did in chapter 3, that we ought to be praying at all times for what? Wisdom that comes from above. James says, he that lacketh wisdom, let him ask God for it. And he says, God will what? Generously give it to you. Now, brothers and sisters, this is big. In every situation, no matter what it is, as a child of God, you and I ought to always be asking God for his wisdom. You know, God, I don't trust myself. I'm not that wise. I'm not that smart. I'm not that intelligent to where I can make the right decision here. 
and get honest with God, Sister Palm, and say to God, God, I don't trust myself because why? As Paul says, because every time I would do good, evil is always present. And the evil that Paul was referring to is the evil that's within us. And every one of us have an evil in us. And that's called the flesh. And so Paul says, I don't trust myself. And so that's what your prayer ought to be. Your prayer ought to be, God, I don't trust myself. I don't have enough intellect. I don't have enough wisdom on my own to make the decision or to what make choices or to whatever the case may be or to settle disputes. I need your wisdom. And so James says, if we pray and ask God for wisdom, God who is generous will do what? He will give us the wisdom that we need. And the reason why you're not experiencing the wisdom from above, James says, is because you're not asking for it. Help me somebody. So, so listen, so you and I needs to know that chapter 4, verses 1 through 12 is an example of the wisdom from above that James is uh, talking about. He, and he says, wisdom from above leads to life, but wisdom from below, rather, is earthly and demonic. And so therefore, let me say that again, that the wisdom that James is talking about in verse one through 12 of chapter four, really he's talking about earthly, not heavenly. It's wisdom that comes from, from what? From earthly. Any questions or comments? All right, look at your handout. The exposition of idea, community discord, conflicts and quarrels have their root in selfish internal ambitions that are worldly, fleshly, and demonic. If you read James chapter 4, verse 1 through 12, you're going to see that right there. So let's do it again. Community discord, that's, that's confusion, that's fights, that's arguments within the body, that's community. It comes from what? It comes from selfish ambitions that are worldly, fleshly, and demonic. Whenever couples come and sit with us, uh, you know, that's one of the things that we immediately try to determine whether or not uh, that couple or somebody in the marriage is fighting for their way. You know, when you want your way, Sister Banks, you are fight. And one of the things it, I've tried to do in the 26 years of marriage, uh, Sister Horn, is not to fight to get my way, but I argued to what? To, for what's right. So I don't argue to be right. I argue for what is right. And when you argue, Nelda, to be right, or for what is right, rather, rather than to get your way, you would be surprised as how many arguments you would have or how quick the arguments will be over with. Now, you can't stop folk from you can't stop folk from bumping. You can't stop them from talking now. People are going to do that because it's just nature. But you don't have to do the talking, and you don't have to go back and forth with folk. And Sister Collins, some, most times I've learned to just look at you because when I state my cause or state the case, I argue for what is right and not to be right. And Joseph, in the church, we need to be arguing for what is right and not to be right. And if you're going to, Brother Tate, argue for what is right, then you're going to argue the word of God. Because the only person that is right all of the time is who? Is God. Amen? The exposition. Number one, 318 finished on a powerful promise. Namely, that those who promote peace produce peace. Peace. We just talked about that. James 3.18. Those that promote peace produce peace. If you are a peacemaker and if you are sowing peace, you're going to always do what? Reap it. Now, 4.1 moves back to the matter of a lack of peace witnessed by quarrels and fights. And there are some people even in the church just don't have peace. They come here with hell in them. You look at them wrong, and they're ready to tear you off. 
And what that says is that they lack peace within themselves. They lack peace within themselves. Have you ever met somebody that's just mad all the time? Ain't no reason to be mad. They're just mad because they're mad. And they're walking around with frowns on their face at all times. I'm sorry? Oh, how do you handle that person? Listen, uh, Paul says, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. Sometimes, sometimes you just have to handle them with a long handle smooth spoon. You don't have to let everybody in you in the circle now. But you, but you are obligated to love everybody. You know, there's a saying the folks say, the young people say, I, I got to protect my peace. Well, you protect your peace by keeping some folk at bay. But you always what? You always love. Three, if true wisdom emerges from and grows in peace, then wars and fights in the community of believers are testimony to be willful, resistant of wisdom and peace. It is testimony to be willful resistance of wisdom and peace. Willful resistance of wisdom and peace. Four, four one contains two rhetorical questions. We talked about that. The first question starts with the word, uh, the Greek word integrated, which means where, I mean, from where. That seeks to the source of peaceless status of affairs. And so what Paul, I mean, what Peter is doing is asking the question as to the source of quarreling. And then the second question answers the first question using another Greek uh, word that says that quarrel and fights comes from where? It comes from within. Peter gives us the answer. It comes from within. Yeah, I went on four, five, and six. It's, yeah, it's right there in the text. Okay. Number seven. The phrase within you is literally to your members. Now, this is going to be big, so I want you to really pay attention. The phrase within you is literally in your members. Wherein members can mean a members slash people within a congregation or B, members of a person's individual body, mental life. I want to do that again because I want you to get it. The phrase within you, the ESV translation, is literally in your members. Within members can mean members, which is people, within a congregation, or be members of a person's individual body, mental life. In other words, Paul's, I mean, Peter, when he asked the question, what is the source of quarreling? And he talks about it, it's within you, it's in the person, and so, it could, it could mean that it's in the body. It could be people, could be your problem, as most of us think people are. And or it could be an internal battle within you. You got it? It could be people or it could be you. Remember what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6? I like what Paul talks about there. Uh, Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Spiritual wickedness in high places. And what Paul is saying here, uh, Sister Bradford, Paul is saying that people is not our problem. When he said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, he tell us who our fight is really with. In other words, we are engaged, Sister Philip, in a spiritual battle. And Satan is always behind the problem. But you got to get this, Michael. 
that just like God uses people, Satan uses people. You can either be an instrument in the hands of God or you can be an instrument in the hands of Satan. It's up to you. And so James asked the question where the source is. Is it people or is it within you? And look at number eight. Of the two options above, option B is the best option. It ain't people, it's you. Flip Wilson uh, was known for a phrase that he used, the devil made me do it. But how many of you know that the devil can't make you do nothing? The devil didn't make you do it, brother so well. You did it because you what? You wanted to do it. And so you can say all day long, people, oh, people makes me, people make me cut up. People make me just want to cuss. People make me, no. People can't make you. What people can do, if they are in the hands of the wrong person, they can make what's in you come out. But it's already where? Well. It's already in you. Amen, somebody. Oh yeah, now they can't they can make what's in you come out. But, but you have to have wisdom. You have to ask God for wisdom. God, help me, show me. Sister Banks says, how do you handle those people that's always uh, causing disturbance and confusion? God, give me wisdom. Help me to walk circumspectively among them. Show me how to deal with them. Ask God for that wisdom. And so you won't be falling into that Flip Wilson trap. Am I making sense? Number nine, several places in the New Testament provide support that was that what is in view is a single human having a battlefield inside resulting in internal conflict. Y'all see that? Let me do it again. Several places in the New Testament provide support that what is in view is a single human having a battlefield inside resulting in internal conflict. In other words, the battle is in you. The war is in you. The turmoil is in you. It ain't in somebody else, it's in you. Now let's, let's look at First Peter chapter two, verse 11 says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to sustain from the passion of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Now he says, abstain from what? Passions of the flesh. Underline that. Peter said, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain, abstain, keep away from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Romans 7, verse 21 to 23. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members, talking about my what? My flesh. In my members, another war, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And so Paul says that there is an inner battle. There is an inner war going on. The flesh versus the spirit. And Sister Williams, the one that you feed the most is going to be the strongest. And if you feed the flesh, the flesh going to always win. But if you, if you feed the spirit, the spirit will win. And the only thing you can feed the spirit is what? The word of God. 
Prayer in the word. That's why you ought to always be praying. Pray without ceasing. And that's why you ought to study to show yourself approved. You need to know how to handle trials when they come up. You need to know how to respond to various situations when they arise. And listen at this, Sister Glover. There is not one thing you would ever go through in life that God has not already addressed in his word. I promise you. But you got to read the book. There is what? Not one thing that you will ever go through in life that God has not already answered in his book. But you got to study. Look at the last scripture, Galatians 5, 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. The what? The desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. That's that inner battle. That's that inner fight. For these are opposite of each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And so when Paul says that, he, when Paul says every time I would do good, evil is always present, he's talking about the evil within you, not the evil that's without. The evil that's within you. And so when he says, when I would do good, evil is always present, and what he's literally saying, Reverend Bank, when I would do good, I'm always present. Yeah, because the, the evil is in me. And how many of you know everything begins with a thought? And if you don't take the thought captive, it'll mess with your attitude. And if you, if you don't fool around here and don't take it captured at the attitude, it'll show sure enough mess with your behavior. And listen, listen, Mitch, when you don't take your thoughts captive, those evil thoughts captive, you'll walk in the church and immediately you'll think somebody looking evil at you. Look at her staring at me. And don't nobody even know you in the building but you. Yeah, yes. Some of us show up on Sunday morning with hell in us. Take it your thoughts captive. Y'all heard that saying that the only way Satan comes to church, he hitches a ride? Because he can't drive, so he's always hitching. He's a hitchhiker. The question is, is, is he riding with you? And if you let him nail the ride long enough with you, he gonna kick you out and he gonna drive. Amen, somebody. And so those three, those three uh, scriptures that we gave, it's, 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 it's uh, given so that you can see that uh, even in the text, the New Testament, it flushes out the fact that we have an inner battlefield. And we ought to always be submitting ourselves to the Lord because in and of our own strength, we cannot. There is no way, y'all, we can obey God all of the time without submitting to God. That's the only way we could do it. 10, as James has argued and we are argued again, social unrest among the people of God has its roots in worldly ambitions, agendas of the heart, which manifest in power struggles Backstabbing, backbiting, etc. Argue, arguments, fights has its roots in worldly ambitions, which results in power struggle, backbiting, and backstabbing. That's why, I, that's why I said that uh, some people want what they want so much, Michael, they're willing to sin to get it, and they'll sin when they don't. They will lie, they will cheat, they will steal. They will, they will betray you. 
They will do all kinds of things just to get what they want. Why? Because their affections are set on the flesh. They want their way. 11, all of these types of motives and behaviors unveils a worldly origin where demons and evil rule. Where demons and evil rule. Somebody said, you mean to tell me I could be saved and still operate like this? Yeah. If you are not submitting yourself to the spirit. Yes. Twelve. The, the, the internal quest are for power, honor, and fame. These are the pleasures or passions of which James speaks. James says that when our uh, quest is for power, honor, or fame, we fight. Anybody that stands in our way of getting it. 13. For James, internal division produces external strife. Internal division produces external fights for which the spiritual remedy is repentance and humility before God. Now look at that again. Internal division produces external fight. So if you're fighting within you, if there's a, if that, if there's a turmoil going on within you, if your flesh is at war within you seeking power, seeking honor, seeking fame, seeking your way, that it would be manifested in what? In external ways. Y'all see that? And James says that the only remedy is what? Repentance and humility before God. And we'll see that as we continue in James. 14, this one verse, which is James chapter four, verse one, strongly advises that we spend considerable time asking ourselves what our, our internal motivations and agendas truly are. James says that we ought to spend considerable time asking ourselves what are our internal motivations and agendas truly are? Because they potentially are hazardous and antagonistic to the rule of Christ in our hearts and ruinous to our relationship in Christ. And ruinous, it ruins our relationship. And so brothers and sisters, listen. James advises us who are the people of God that we take time to do what? Search our hearts. That's what a wonderful prayer to pray. Every believer in here, uh, you, you, I'm sure you've heard it said before, so I'm, I'm going to echo it here. It's nothing uh, that originates from me. Uh, I can't take credit for it, but I sure am going to put it here. Every believer ought to read and reread and then commit to memory Psalms 139. Every believer. Now I want you to go to that. I want you to go to Psalms 139. And, and Psalms 139. Michael has the mic. Anybody want to read for us, you can lift your hands and he's going to bring you the mic. But I want you to hear what the psalmist says. 139. And again, 
I, this, is, this is something that every believer ought to commit to. As a matter of fact, I challenge you for the next uh, 30 to 90 days, 30 is one month, 90 is three months, to make this Psalm 139 your daily devotional read. I, I challenge you to do that, that you do that. Listen to what the psalmist says, because listen at this. If in fact, if in fact, we are going to be asking ourselves, look at number 14 on your, on your outline. Number 14 says, this one verse, James 4, 1, strongly advises that we spend considerable time asking ourselves what our internal motivations and agendas truly are because they potentially are hazardous and antagonistic to the rule of Christ in our hearts and run us in, to our relationship with Christ. And so, Reverend Philip, if I'm really serious about my relationship with the Lord, if I'm really serious about pleasing him, if I'm really serious about winning this battle against the flesh, then I want to encourage you to read and then even commit to memory Psalms 139. I hear you, I hear you, I hear you, I hear what you're saying, but Brother Basil, that's 24 verses, so what? We, we know every verse to every song we like, and, and you better not put out a rap. Come on, y'all. How many of you can, can, never mind, let's go. Psalms 139, Brother Ray gonna start off reading, go ahead. Okay. What, are you, what translation are you using? Uh, uh, Never mind, brother, just read. I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> you caught me, I don't know. Okay, that's okay. King James. King James, okay, 139. O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Yeah, hold on. L look, look at what the psalmist have already said. Lord, you have searched me and what? Known me. You know when I sat down, and you know when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar off. Yo, the summit says that there is absolutely nothing about you God don't already know. Uh, uh, Pastor, I, I, I told a man for 30 plus years that I've taught him man to man that I can remember as I was drawing close to the Lord trying to really get to know him, uh, Sister Horn, in an intimate way. Every time I would go in prayer to confess my sin to the Lord because I wanted to be cleansed of it, and not only that I want to be cleansed, I wanted to be free from it. And every time I went in prayer, I Reverend Philip to pray, and I got to that particular sin that I needed to confess to the Lord so I can come clean, the enemy would always meet me in prayer, and the enemy would say to me, you can't tell God that. The, the enemy said, God is too holy. You can't tell him that. If you tell God that, he's going to think differently of you. He's going to, God, God is holy. Man, how are you going to tell God something like that? And this is the truth, y'all. This is not something that I read in the book or made up. This is true. This went on for weeks. This went on for months. This even went on for years. And finally, one day I was in prayer, Michael, and I got to that particular issue that God and I needed to do business over. And the enemy said to me, you can't tell God that. Now, I done told you, you can't tell God that. He's too holy. But while he was whispering in the left ear, the Holy Spirit broke in from the right ear. And the Holy Spirit said, but he already knows. And I got thou read the mouth. I start telling them everything. Be because the Holy Spirit convinced me of what the psalmist is, is saying, that God knows it all. There is nothing about you God doesn't already know. You ain't informing God of anything. You're just confessing. Are y'all with me? 
And so the psalmist says, he knows, he's already searched you, and he already knows everything there is to know about you. He know when you sat down, he know when you rise up. And then let me tell you what scripture really got me. When this scripture, listen, when I came, Reverend Horace, across this particular scripture, it really did mess me up. Because Meechus, here's what the scripture says, that he knows the number of hair that's on my head. Every time I went to the barbershop, I, that was a floor full of hair when the barber got through. And then they would keep growing, and then I go back to the barber, and I may not have none up here, but that's because I've been to the barbershop. But God says, you look at the pastor, it's shining over there. Ain't nothing up there. But God says he knows the number of hair string that's on our head that messed me up. That means he knows everything, absolutely, about me. Keep reading. Keep reading. Okay. Number five. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for <laughs> me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Mm. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Hold it. The summers ask a question. Where can I go to get away from you? Where can I go to flee your presence? He says, if I make my bed in hell, if I take wings and fly to the uttermost parts of the earth, he said, your presence is that. In other words, he's talking about the omnipresence of God. There is not one place you won't find God. And listen at this, Sister Banks. I don't care how dark the room is. He sees it all. He knows it what? All. God knows everything. You can't fool him. That's all I'm trying to get you to hear me. You cannot fool God. There is nothing you can hold back from God. God knew. And listen, uh, Pastor, he said to the prophet Jeremiah, he says, I knew your thoughts even when they were far off. In other words, uh, he said to Jeremiah, as he said to you and I, before you know your thoughts, I knew them. That's just how omniscient he is, all knowing. And, and listen, that's another thing that messed me up. The, the, some of my thoughts could be evil. And God says, I knew every evil thought you were going to think before you thought them. And Joseph, that's when I really started falling in love with him. Because I cannot imagine, I cannot to this day even phantom the evil thoughts that he knew about me. He knew every time I would deny him. He knew every time I would betray him. But yet he saved me. Thank you, Holy Spirit. But before he saved me, he let me be born. He knew I was going to be wicked, and he still let me come into this world. What an awesome God he is. And we have the audacity to not worship, and then we have the audacity to try to fool him. I can remember Sister Horn as if it was today. I, I, can, I can remember when I was at home, growing up at home, and, and my mother will walk in sometime and say, boy, what's the matter? Uh, uh, boy, what you done got yourself into? And I said, nothing, mama. She said, boy, I'm your mama. You can't fool me. I already know. And then there were times, uh, Meech said, I went to my daddy to, to talk to my daddy about some things, to come clean about some things. He said, I already knew that. I was just waiting on you. And then I thought about, wow, I was waiting down all of this time. He already know. And if I came clean a long time ago, I could have been free. And that's what God is saying. Y'all already know. I already know. I already know. Hold on, the mic is coming. The mic is coming. 
a lot of times people think they're getting by and getting away. They're, if they go way across town, you know God is over there. But hmm, yeah. you just said he's everywhere. He's, he's everywhere. <laughs> He is everywhere. And you know, there's some folk who do evil. They think they can throw rocks and hide their hands. I may not see, but God saw the rock. Oh, bless his name. Come on, let's go back to the scripture. Pick up. 13. Verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Mm. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm. Marvel, marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lower, lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when us yet there was none of them. Okay, thank you, Brother Ray. Sister uh, Horn, pick up verse number 17 and read the remainder of that chapter, if you will. Verse uh, number 17. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. Mm. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against the wicked. Mm. You, I'm sorry, and your enemy take my, I'm sorry, name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those uh, who are against you? I hate them with the uttermost hatred. They have become my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any hurtful ways in me mm. and lead me in the everlasting way. Amen. Thank you for the reading, Brother Ray and Sister Horn. Now, brothers and sisters, again, Psalms 31 is an excellent psalm for you to read daily and to pray even pray over, committed to memory, because what you're asking God to do is search your heart. God, you already know it, and everything that you find that shouldn't be, take it out. That's a song that the old church used to sing, search me, Lord. Search me, Lord. If you find anything that shouldn't be, take it out and strengthen me. For I want to be right, I want to be whole. I want to be what? Saved. That ought to be our prayer. Because brothers and sisters, I don't care who you are. I don't care how much scripture you think you know. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how active you are in the church body. You better recognize the fact that you got an enemy within you. And you need God's wisdom in order to conquer the enemy that's within you so that the spirit of God can have his way through you. Now, on the last page, we have um, meditation reading of the week. And you see the first one up there is what? Psalms 139. And then read the rest of those things. But I want you to really take serious Psalms 139. Read it. Read them all. Read all the scriptures. But I want you to read Psalms 139 uh, every day as your devotion. And if you don't have a devotion, wow, it's a good time to get one. Because again, you nor I would be able to live out the Christian life in a way that God intends for us to live it out without the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you will agree with me that what God has called us to is much bigger than us. It's much, listen, when God says love your enemy, when he say pray for those that despitefully misuse you, bless those that curse you, you can't do that in and of your own strength. You need the enabling power 
of the Holy Spirit. And so James asked the question. Let's, let's close on the same note that we open up in. James asked the question, James 4, 1, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war against you? That's why, that's why we, you're fighting. That's why you're walking around with rocks in your jaw. It's because your flesh wants its way and somebody is standing in the way of your flesh obtaining what it wants. And you ought to be asking God to change your desires for his desires. And just what you want, God may not want for you. And if God doesn't want it for you, you ought to not want it. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much.